It's uh, Daylight Savings Sunday, second only to Resurrection Sunday, amen? <laughs> you guys feeling that extra hour? Woo! I am, boy, it came at a great time this week. I remember about a month ago, I said, you know, when is Daylight Savings? And my wife said, it's not till November, and I thought, goodness gracious. Well, then this week, um, I had uh, the Trinity Trifecta come down upon me of plagues. I had a, a sinus cold that's typical of this time of year. And then I had a conjunctivitis in my eyes, either caused by or simultaneously um, agitated by a, uh, a reaction to a weaponized pepper I had at Flipside this week and uh, nearly killed me. I survived. <laughs> So I'm here with uh, glasses that are uh, far, uh, way, way past my current prescription. I can see you generally. I hopefully will keep the notes, but we'll pray through that. I think we have a verse that you guys are working on, right? A memory verse? It's a new word? Oh, great, because I don't know it. So um, I was thinking, oh boy, if I've got to have this by memory, this is going to get fun. So here we go. This is uh, Psalm 79, 13, and I don't know how you usually do it, but let's stand and we'll read this verse together. It'll help uh, get the blood flowing, get your brain engaged, and maybe you'll remember this next week. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will thank you forever and ever, praising your greatness from generation to generation. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So today we are going to be in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 28. So if you have a Bible and you want to flip there, that's great. It'll be up on the screen. But while you get situated into that, I want to ask you a question to get us started. When you're by yourself, when you're alone, and it's just you, and there's no distractions, and there's no noise, do you sense the presence of God, or do you feel utterly alone? And this question is posed, I think, as, as important as the question of, on the day you die, do you know where you will go when you enter your rest? We just celebrated those who have passed on into uh, God's presence, into heaven. And a lot of times we talk of faith in terms of that. What's going to happen in the afterlife? That we repent and we come to Christ so that we can have eternal life. And, and sometimes we think that eternal life begins when we step through the pearly gates and we, we gaze upon heaven itself and, and the streets of gold are beneath our feet and the loved ones who have gone before us are there to greet us. But today I want to talk about eternity starting now. I, I want to talk about the nature of the relationship that God wants to have with us, with you and with me. Because when we are with Christ we can find his presence and never be alone. He wants to not only be the God of our eternal rest, he wants to be the God that is walking with us in our day-to-day -day here on earth. He wants to be the God that is on the top of the mountain at the end, but he also wants to be the, the shepherd that guides you through the valley of the shadow of death. Amen? And so, as we consider uh, God's relationship, I want to look at uh, the words of King David to his son Solomon. David, as we remember, was a young boy who took on a giant because the giant was mocking God and God's people. And so David had this amazing faith at around the age of 12 years old that took him out onto a battlefield he had with him his uh, uh, sling with few stones, something that wouldn't be very intimidating to a, a giant of Goliath's stature. And through his faith, he slings that stone, hits the giant between the eyes, 
and we know the rest of the story. God is glorified. And David continues on in this amazing life of walking with God and having this amazing faith. The Bible calls him the man after God's own heart. And so if there was anyone that knew this relationship with God that we could learn from, it would be David. He wrote almost all of the Psalms, the Psalms that we come to know and love, that we have memorized, that we uh, went through today. He, he wrote the, the 23rd Psalm saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. These words comfort us. They were the very words of David who had a relationship with the God of the universe. And what I want to challenge you today is that you can have a relationship with God like David. David had a relationship with God prior to the oncoming of Jesus. Prior to the fulfillment of God's promises, he could walk with God. And so how much more you and I today living in the hope of Christ's resurrection, can we walk with Jesus day in and day out? So let's look together at 1 Chronicles chapter 28, beginning in verse 9. David is giving a charge to his son. It's come the end of his days. He's seen more mornings than he has mornings left to see. Amen? Some of you might be able to relate to that today. And so he recognizes that the day is going to come when he will no longer be there for his son. And he's handing the kingdom over to Solomon. And this is the words that the man after God's own heart gives to his son. He says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. David says, the nature of God is that you should know him. That you should read the scriptures, that you should engage in him through prayer and daily walk. Because the reality is he knows your heart. You should commit your plans to him because the reality is he knows your thoughts. He knows your plans before you bring them forward. And he makes this amazing comparison. He says, if you seek him... He will be found by you. There is this game that transcends every culture. It is this reality that parents share with children in their development. It's almost a phenomena. When we were in Toronto, no matter what the mother language was, no matter where people came from, this game was present in every family. And the game was hide and seek. And it starts out when babies are unable to move and they're just a sack of flour there making expressions. Maybe it's gas, maybe it's a smile. Everyone's happy either way. And eventually someone will come along and hide their face and reveal it. And hide their face and reveal it. And the child responds with laughter and joy. The face goes away. The child's curious. The face returns. It then progresses as they go from going along and crawling along the carpet and picking up every little piece of lint and, and anything else that's down there and putting it in their mouth. And then they start walking and they, they toddle around and the game becomes a game of hide and seek where the child will go hide behind the sofa. The father or the mother will say, oh, where did Jimmy go? And of course, the child can't hardly contain himself and he starts giggling and he can be heard, but the, but the parent pretends for a little while longer they can't find him. Then the child is found, there's rejoicing and the game reverses. The father hides, the mother hides. And it gets longer and longer and progresses uh, 
to, to a greater difficulty of hide and seek as the child develops. And I think as David is talking to his son Solomon here, he's remembering back to those days. If you're a parent, it doesn't matter if your child is 7, 17, 27, or 47. When you look at them, you still see that seven-year-old. Amen? I mean, th there are still memories in that face of those times together. And David, I think, is remembering back to the days when he and Solomon would play hide-and-seek. And he's telling his son, this is the nature of God's relationship with you. He wants you to have a hide-and-seek faith. And this certainly plays out to be true, doesn't it? Sometimes in our lives, we feel like God has, has snuck up on us. And in the most unsuspecting ways, he'll show up in our lives or in our days. Perhaps you've, you've come this morning and in worship you experience him or in a message it relates and all of a sudden you get this, this aha moment with God where he shows up in your life. And other times it feels like God is so distant and we wonder where is he? We go through tragedy and we go through struggle. But in order to understand the nature of our relationship with God, we have to follow the game of hide and seek. Sometimes we think, God, why don't you make yourself plain to me? You know, why don't you show up when I'm hurting? Why don't you show up when, I'm, when I want you to be there? Why don't you show up when I ask for particular things and you don't answer the way I want you to? But to understand the nature of the game, you have to understand who it is that hides first. And to see this, we can go to Genesis chapter 3 and see where the game began. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're in perfection. They're in comfort. It's, it's constantly never, you know, it's never below 72. It's never above a 76. It, there's food galore. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. There's no separation. God walks with them in the garden. They walk with God. They walk with one another. They're married. All is happy. And then God says, there's one thing I don't want you to do. And man does the very thing God says don't do. And isn't this the truth in our lives? I mean, it doesn't matter if you grow up with the Bible or you only hear, like, murder's bad, right? It doesn't matter what the rules are. As soon as you hear a rule, you seem inclined to break it, don't you? I mean, go into the toddler's classroom this morning. Let's take a bag of marshmallows. We'll put it on the table. We'll crack it open. And we'll say, listen, you can do anything in here you want, just don't eat a marshmallow, right? If we walk out of that room, there will not be a marshmallow left when we come back in, right? There will be fighting, there'll be brawling over who gets more marshmallows, right? This is human nature. And so we find ourselves separated from God, just as Adam and Eve found themselves they eat the fruit that they were told not to eat and all of a sudden it says they realize their shame that they're naked and that they've done what they shouldn't do and a feeling comes into their hearts that had yet to be there in perfection and this is where we pick up the story genesis chapter 3 verse 8 it says and they heard the sound of the lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, I hid myself. See, we hide from God. You know, there are people whom we invite to church and they don't come because they feel shame. They, they don't feel good enough to be in the presence of God. They don't feel like they're good enough to be in church. 
And they totally misunderstand the game of hide and seek. Just like that, Adam and Eve are afraid. God comes and says, where are you, Adam? Where are you, Adam? Just like the parent that comes into the room and the child's behind the sofa. The parent knows where the kid is. God isn't confused by what has happened. He knows Adam and Eve have sinned. He gives them the opportunity. He shows them that he's willing to seek after them, even though they've sinned. And from the very beginning, even though sin is present, God's grace is present. That he would be willing to even seek them out. God is all-powerful, all-knowing. If it were all about judgment, God could have struck the two of them dead right as they took a bite. But instead, God seeks them out. So are you hiding from God? Are there things in your life that you think are too much for God to handle? That you've gone too far? And sure, he's forgiven a lot of people but how could he forgive you? We hide first, and maybe you're hiding today. But I want to encourage you, God is seeking you, just as he did Adam and Eve. He knows what you've done, where your life has been, and where you have gone. And he's provided a way to reconcile the relationship. And so the second thing is that God seeks man. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus is walking down a path, and a man named Zacchaeus, the Bible says, seeks to see who Jesus is. He wants to know who this man is that is healing and cleansing and redeeming and giving these messages of hope and, and forgiveness. And so he's short in stature. He has to climb up in a tree to seek God out. And as Jesus, who appears to just be walking down a path, shows Zacchaeus that he's just not on his way to the next town, he's actually seeking him. And when he sees Zacchaeus in the tree, he says, Zacchaeus! And Zacchaeus is confused because he's never met Jesus. Jesus says, come on down, let's go to your house for lunch. It's a good idea. I might try that after service. Zacchaeus has Jesus over for lunch because Jesus found Zacchaeus in the midst of Zacchaeus seeking Jesus out. See how the game is being played? And at the end of their interaction, Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give everything back that I stole. Every, every way I defrauded someone, I'm going to give it back and then some. And Jesus ends his statement with Zacchaeus in chapter 19, verse 10, by saying this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to seek us out. He came to seek out the lost, the hiding, those who are hiding in the shadows, afraid to be in the presence of God. And the amazing reality is, God is still seeking today. And so He's seeking you. He is seeking you no matter where you are. Whether it feels like it or not, God pursues his people. And so we should seek him. Like Zacchaeus, we too can seek out God, find his presence in our lives, and find the forgiveness and acceptance that Zacchaeus found. And so we hide, God seeks then he hides and we seek and here's the good news if you're in the midst of a time where you think God is hiding from you it's not a rejection God isn't saying I'm done with you I don't want to be a part of your life anymore it's a game 
If you feel that the Lord has hidden His face from you, or that He's hiding from you in some way, His presence, He's just in the other room. He's awaiting you to pursue Him. And so it's our job to seek Him. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, Jesus says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus says, if you seek, you will find. If you seek, you will find. And again, he gives this comparison of a loving father who is present in your life, but engaged in this amazing game. You know, there, there is an amazing uh, process that this game brings in the life of a child, in the psychology of a child. A child learns something very important when you play hide and seek. The child learns to become their own individual. The child learns that even though they can't see you, it doesn't mean you're gone. When an infant is in a crib and there is, no, the, is not the presence of its parents, it will cry and cry and cry, inconsolable. But as we grow and become children, we play this game with our parents. And we come to the realization through this game that we can be in the other room, but our Father is still in our life and loving us. Indeed, he's seeking us out. And he can go into the next room and we know if we seek him out, we will find him. This is the reality of God's relationship with you. And so my question is, are you hiding? And if so, allow him to seek you out. And are you seeking and if not, why not? Because if you do, you will most certainly find him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that reveals to us your nature. We thank you that we can have a relationship with our heavenly father through this hiding and seeking. Lord, we know that all of us have fallen short, that only one lived a perfect life and he lived a life that he would pursue us, seek us out, and give us the opportunity to have a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who, who don't see you right now, that from their perspective, you're hiding from them. I pray they would see the invitation to seek you out. And I pray for those of us that are hiding from you, that we would allow you to find us right where we're at, to rejoice in the fact that the God of the universe would pursue us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.